to fleet you off Capita? I didn't ask, and I don't think so. Um, uh, today, this is the build OGM call for Tuesday, July 6th, 2021. And I'll go back to sharing the screen uh, because I'm reporting in on a lovely conversation I had yesterday with Christine Capra. First call, uh, the company is called Greater Than the Sum, uh, and they built this thing, Sum app, which basically has, it, you know, it's like a, I called it Survey Monkey for Networks. Uh, they're creating a database, of a bunch of interesting information to us, I think. And in particular, she's got some posts about social system mapping uh, and a lot of really a lot of wisdom and time on this. And they're uh, busy trying to figure out what their business model is and how this all works. So, and I just wish I had recorded the call from, from the moment we started. I, I recorded none of it and we were in her Zoom. So I didn't, it wasn't quick for me to just click in and do it. But it, what the, I wish I could bottle that excitement in the conversation because she's, uh, not quite as old as me, so she's she's been around the block. But but she was like, you know, I don't I don't bring up these topics very much because I don't get to have these conversations very much. Uh, and I was like, come on in, join the OGM conversation, and we would love to figure out how to um, uh, how to build up some way to be helpful to you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we'll, uh, she, we both need to sort of chew on the conversation. We'll come back in and probably invite more people into a conversation so we can figure out what's up. Um, but uh, several things about the conversation got me really excited. Uh, one of which was, this is a necessary conversation. It's important to organizations like this. Um, the, she was really interested in steward ownership and that whole conversation because she said, look, I've been looking you know, for the last long period for what is our business structure. This is sort of the same conversation, Phil, that Michael um, has kind of brought up, which is like, we really want to figure out what's the business model here, uh, a business model that kind of works ethically and profitably. Um, so she was really interested in that. And uh, I'm going to introduce her to Jordan and so forth. Um, so just... Uh, I, I was I was actually like my spirits were raised considerably just from the dynamics of the conversation, um, and then I'm sitting here thinking, okay, what are the what are the moving parts that we should? I would love to brainstorm with you all, um, uh, barring that we have a bigger topic or something else uh, to go toward. What are the elements that are important for us to do for OGM to be more of a structure, to have more of a more of an essence, more of more structure, I guess. So let me stop. Anybody else just would like to check in? Yeah, to that <clears throat> to the question you're asking, Jerry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I mean, Jordan is super supportive you know, for for me to get off the ground and and connect and and you know, find uh, um, a real a real tangible mission to grab onto, but. What I'm noticing, <clears throat> watching, you know, a number of groups and and also you know, the uh, GRC, um, there are so many new entries. I mean, it's incredible how many groups are coming in, and you don't really know how backed up they are and what their resources are and so on. But they're all full of enthusiasm, um, and there seems to be quite a bit of funding slushing around uh, in the food arena in particular. Um, but everybody is working in their own bucket, you know. The, 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 what is completely missing in my mind is this coordinating effort. You know? And this is where my, my thing with the innovations focus, I think, really resonates. You know, the, the, because to to uh, I, I had a meeting with uh, my contact from the four per thousand. I'm on the advisory board for the United Nations Food Systems Summit. You know? And so we, <clears throat> we had a, a conversation about something that he's trying to do. And I brought in this concept of a, of a uh, uh, knowledge manager, you know, the, the innovations manager. He got all excited about it. You know, so he's going to incorporate that uh, into the discussion. We, we set up, in fact, uh, a, spe a dedicated discussion group that involves the secretary general because he's just so excited this is what we need to do with Africa, with South America and so on. But you're always working behind the scene, you know, and, and, and really the best you can often do is just to stimulate a discussion and to open people's eyes. And once they see it, they start running and off they are. So I don't know how, how uh, 
we can create a structure, you know, that has a right to an entity of its own. Yeah. So, so Klaus, um, the innovation brokers are kind of, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when I talk about story threaders, and I think when Pete talks about context beavers, and maybe we talk about map whispers, and also Christine was really interested in this, this idea of a map, a map whispers guild or some collecting of people who, who are really good at mapping and understand it deeply. Um, they all will need some kind of a platform that is both uh, a way to make a living, a way to connect, build community, build a guild or some guildish features, and um, to my mind, uh, use and improve the tools and the data in the commons. Uh, because the information brokers are basically going to be like uh, wholesale connecting humans, connecting them to uh, ways of doing particular things that, that, that need to be done across the industry. There's a whole bunch of that, right? And then if, if an OGM infrastructure existed, I would love for information brokers to be using it uh, like crazy and improving it as they use it, right? Um, so my so my my the question I just want to pose is: Is there some minimal set of things that we don't wind up creating, but can but pull together from different places to create a platform for a new occupation called innovation broker that is simply one of many different uh, kinds of new uh, roles that we envision that we would like to staff up and recruit for and get get hired into engagements everywhere, and I, I think that. I, th I think that experts, experts managing commons uh, is hopefully a new job category that will be hard for the robots to automate and might be a big and interesting place for new kinds of employment, for people, for remote work, for all, other kinds of things in this world. Uh, and Klaus first and then, and then Phil. Yeah, see, I see um, the, the primary, purpose for, for the, the gap, so to speak, um, is in taking an assessment, uh, in, in my food case, going to a community, each community is unique in its own right. Uh, and, and it doesn't matter where that community is located, but they have existing resources, they have an, in, an, in, a, an existing socioeconomic structure, there's a power structure uh, with existing interests, you know, and so, you have to map first of all who are the players. You know what is working, what is not working in in this group. Uh, so I call it the farm to fork community food systems. Yeah, and, and because from the farm you need an aggregator, you need logistics, you need processing, you need wholesale retail, and so on and so on. And, and so what are, what components are in place? Which ones are missing? How can you accelerate this system? What do they need to know to move themselves to the next phase? That's in its core thing. Once you do this map, then, uh, uh, then you need someone in the field who knows, which, who knows where the resources are located and how to call them up. That's the basic uh, uh, concept. And I think one could translate that into energy systems and into other aspects of a community. Um, Phil and then Pete and then me. Um, yeah, one thing just generally, I was also in a, in a chat re recently about how you kind of put these amorphous voluntary groups into action. Uh, and one thing that really came up was creating a timeline of sorts. So there are things we need to figure out as a group, like what exactly OGM is, if we give ourselves a month or two weeks or whatever it is, it has to be figured out by then. And then from there, figuring out how OGM works with other entities. And if, if that's putting out requests for proposal for projects uh, like Klaus's or, or projects with knowledge weavers or whatever the project is, but putting out an RFP and timelining that and identifying that OGM's role in that is providing funds and structure um, and then giving those people a, that they need to hit certain milestones or deliverables within a, a structured timeline I think that could be the most concrete way to start moving things forward. That's just uh, where my head is currently. Thanks, Phil. Um, Pete? Um, <clears throat> so uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the platform for <clears throat> innovation brokers or, or knowledge weavers or 
context weavers, um, uh, story threaders. Uh, I, and I guess there's two things for me. One of them is kind of the, the tech infrastructure. And then another one maybe is kind of like, maybe I would call it social, social structure, uh, social infrastructure. Um, so tech infrastructure wise, I, my, my guess is, so obviously, obviously I would love it if everybody was using massive wiki. Um, at the same time, the, the massive wiki doesn't do a lot of things, even that I need, you know, so I use other tools. Um, uh, and so my, I guess my top line thing is a recognition that we're going to have different tools, uh, different people are going to, to use different tools. And so the thing to aim for is interoperability, I think, um, and being able to translate from one to another, uh, easily and well, and with, with good fidelity. Um, I think there's, there's, we're still kind of figuring out what the, um, what, what the atoms or the, the, the molecules of knowledge are. And so, um, it's always great listening to Mark Antoine talk about, uh, knowledge graphs and, and, you know, kind of digging down into what's the, the base unit of, of stuff, because when you understand what the base units are, then you can, uh, decompose and compose them better. Right. So, um, I, we're, we're still kind of fishing around or hunting around for feeling around for what, you know, how do you, how do you get something that goes from Miro to Airtable to massive to Trove, you know, in a, in a chain that has a lot of fidelity rather than, you know, you, you have to morph it and it turns into something un you know, you can't turn it back or, or it gets unusable or whatever. So a lot of work there to do. Um, uh, and that's, I, th I think so, instead of the one tool to, to rule them all, it's really, you know, how, how do we make many tools work together well? Um, so then I also wanted to, there's, I, I feel I can kind of see the thing that's missing, a thing that's missing, um, because I can look back at my time on Silicon Valley a couple decades ago, and Silicon Valley, uh, works differently than big corporations work, uh, and and I reflect on how it worked. So you have lots of little up and coming startups, you know, um, forming and merging and dissolving, and and that kind of birth and death cycle. The the thing that we had in Silicon Valley that I feel like we're missing in the network of network of networks that we're doing right now uh, is maybe not missing, but, but we need to grow it significantly. Uh, it's kind of the, the social patterns and the knowledge patterns of how um, entities form and uh, work together and uh, subtle differences and things like that. So in Silicon Valley, uh, going back to, I don't know, Fairchild, you know, in the, in the seventies or something like that, there kept being these innovations of uh, how a little team of engineers would break off from a parent company and then, you know, in the early days, I'm sure that they didn't know what they were doing and it sounded like they were complete crazy people, hippies or something, you know, it's like, why would you leave a good job and start, you know, you can't start a company, that's not a thing, right? Um, 20 years or 30 years later, startups were a regular par for course kind of thing. Of course you would, you know, you would leave your big company job and start a, a new company. To make that happen, there's a lot of infrastructure built in the Silicon Valley, right? The, there's the VC community, there's the banking community, there's the legal community. Um, you can walk into a bank in Silicon Valley, um, and there's specialist banks, even Silicon Valley Bank, but you can walk into a bank and say, hi, I don't know anything about business, except I've got this great idea. You know, and they would say, okay, well, I can help you with the bank account. I can find a lawyer for you. There, you need some accountants. You need to figure out how to pay taxes. Uh, and same thing with a lawyer, right? It, it's like, I've got this great idea and I've got to have it happen. So you literally walk into in the infrastructure people, you walk into a, a lawyer's office and they say, okay, sounds like a great idea. You look like an upstanding uh, citizen and, and somebody who, who can kind of, that, that I'm willing to spend time with. Lawyers would literally give you like a 10K um, account, a 10K, you know, IOU, 
here, you know, uh, use our services up to, you know, up to a certain amount of money and uh, we'll get you going. And all we ask is for a big cut in return, right? Um, but for somebody who's just starting out, who has a great idea and no, no understanding of the business infrastructure or how that works, so it's huge. So, um, same, same in the in the lawyer's office. Um, each of the lawyers had been through that, you know, cycle dozens or hundreds of times, um, and each of them had been in several law offices all the time. The lawyers are generating this body of knowledge about how deals are done, you know, and you get coaching, right? You start off with an MOU and then you, you start off with NDAs and then you sign MOUs and then, you know, we work on these different structures of how to do profit sharing or uh, equity sharing or things like that. And all the lawyers had seen, uh, it, each law firm has its own uh, catalog of documents, but that catalog of documents is kind of cribbed from all the other catalogs of documents and so there were you know a few flavors of MOU and a few flavors of NDAs and a lawyer would read through and go oh this is from Molson Sonsini this is you know I've seen this before it looks great you can just sign this um, or I'm going to change one thing I'm going to I'm going to send it to opposing counsel in Molson Sonsini and they're going to go oh yeah I get it I understand why they're doing that so that layer of infrastructure of how this thing works and how you can do it um, is something that all of us as little sovereigns are kind of feeling our way through and beating ourselves up and trying to understand what's going on, right? And there's just literally a bunch of missing pieces that we have to innovate. Um, I think we can borrow some of those from places like Silicon Valley or Service Corps of Retired Executives or you know, uh, small business administration or things like that. There's a bunch of stuff that we have to innovate because we're doing business a different way for a different reason. Um, but I, I guess I want to give us kind of, I think, I think there's a, a big missing layer of infrastructure that we have to build. And it's not something that gets built by one or two or four or six organizations. It's actually like dozens and dozens of organizations working together, chewing on how to do that. And then loosely sharing and uh, loosely coupling the information together. That's one of, the, one of the main innovations of Silicon Valley was the loose coupling and the remixing of, of entities. So that happened with companies, it happens with legal agreements, it happens with financial agreements. There's always this innovation stuff and everybody's stealing slash borrowing slash you know like seeing stuff fall off the truck and picking it up um, in some kind of way that was you know maybe a little bit transgressive but also a little bit uh, or, or very productive and and because it was a productive ecosystem of sharing um, even in the face of competition and enclosure it it was sustainable and grow, grew and things like that so lots of lots of innovation lot by lots of, of organizations feeding each other and learning and growing and um uh and that's what we need um just to follow on uh what pete said uh one of the things that i saw lots and lots and lots of groups from other countries come through silicon valley and do tours and learning journeys to try to absorb and carry back home uh, whatever the hell it was, special drink that Silicon Valley had drunk that made this work so well. And there was kind of a superconductivity of financing, of legal help, of programmers, of everything else that moved through it. That's one of the one of the things that made Silicon Valley work really well, all built on extremely proprietary attitudes toward IP and a bunch of other things that are not parts of the stack that we would like. Uh, but Pete, I think a piece of what you're describing is the, the when I talk about what are the next what are the next stacks, the social stack and the organizational stack? You're talking about layers of that organizational stack and how they interact. And you're adding in really important sort of social dynamic aspects of the stack. Like, how do we find each other? How do we recommend each other? How, you know, how does that sort of work out? And, and there's this moment right now where work is kind of, jobs are being deconstructed. And April, one of, uh, one of the uh, superpowers in April's new book is like your portfolio, build your portfolio career, that jobs, as I'm going to be employed for a long period of time working nine to five for a company, those are just going away. They're just, they're just melting. Like 
we may want them, but but the number of those things for the number of humans on earth is just decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. In particular, because companies really don't like full-time employees. They're cranky, they get older, they want more money as they get older, they don't follow instructions. They're, you know, if you can automate a job, it's that, that robot so software wins the comparison with humans as soon as software is good enough to do the job. So in the face of that, how do you build a portfolio career? And part of the organizational stack is not about thinking about organizations as having the old sharp boundaries, but rather as sort of dissolving and having entities, sovereigns and individuals floating around in this, in this primordial goo, which is hopefully a nutritive estuary. <laughs> I love mismatching metaphors. <laughs> so, um, so how do we make this actually a nutritive estuary where lots of healthy interactions show up and where we figure out what's happening, where we can hear, where we can see ourselves well. A piece of what Christine yesterday was talking about was one of the things that really motivated her was to build, I think like Vincent, to build an infrastructure where the, the, the community could see itself. Uh, but then she said, but I don't have this naive hope that once it sees itself, suddenly magically things will, will work well and everything will be fixed. But she didn't know what that next step necessarily was. Right. And that's all that's all really interesting here as well. So sorry. The, the one thing I would underline is that there is a new stack, but I the the stack that I observed in Silicon Valley was actually hundreds of very similar stacks, right? And so I you end up with patterns of stacks and lots of them, and they all look kind of the same and they all have a little bit different flavor depending on the personalities and the use case and things like that. And so I think it's important for for each of us to be working on or or maybe this group to be working on a stack right but but really what you want is a hundred or two hundred or a thousand copies of that stack all kind of looking the same and everybody being able to sing from that same choir book kind of but it's a different choir book over you know in, hundreds in their of own copies. kitchen key kind of yeah yeah but but harmoniously um thanks so uh mark antoine then comes yeah, no, uh, just uh, jump on the last thing about the stacks. Yeah, it means that you don't have to reinvent as much of the wheel. Um, I'm, I don't know if I have an exact point I'm exploring here, but there's this tension between we want to cooperate, we want to create a commons, we want to create, and we're living on scarce resources because not that many people realize they need the kind of connections uh, we're trying to bring because everybody does it well enough serendipitously and doesn't realize how much more it, how much further it could go if we made it more systematic. So there's both, uh, we can do much better and people don't realize that. So the demand is scarce. And on the other hand, uh, so we're in competition in effect but we want to cooperate more because that's who we are and that's part of our mission and raison d'être. Uh, and, and really, we have to think about the ways to, and, and, and thank you, uh, Pete, for re-emphasizing the uh, interop aspect and the not one tool to rule them all. Uh, the, the, but I want to think about federation at a, at a very, very deep level, right? How can we make sure that if ever one of us finds people who understand the need for what we're offering, that it can benefit all of us? And this is the other aspect of federation, because we're building a commons, because whatever we build. And, and another thing about, you know, we're connectors, that means we're all trying to build this tool where we can embody all those connections. So we're all making our little private personal knowledge network. And without the Federation, which we're still busy building, <laughs> uh, we all want to make sure we all have all the data. And that's ridiculous because we want to build that knowledge commons that whatever we build is useful to all of us so that we all gain value and we all share uh, whatever we're building individually. And, and But on the other hand, we are building it also for ourselves and there is value in the understanding we gain by building our little corner of the global brain. Um, so this distinction between scarcity and collective and commons and local and global is 
I don't have answers. I'm just trying to reemphasize the need for thinking about not just finding a raison d'être for us as individuals, but also for us as the added value of us being in a community and us, uh, us being in a commons so that people begin to realize the value of this global stewardship, collective stewardship of this commons we're trying to build, not just our individual value uh, to, you know, whenever we're there with the mission, but our collective value as stewards. And again, no answers, just trying to. And one of the commons that I think, oh, sorry, you were done. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. One of the commons that I think it's important for us to be stewarding or minding or taking care of is just that of community and how we come together and so forth. And uh, Kiko Lab has had a, a bumpy road uh, the last few days, probably weeks. Uh, and, and a bunch of people have come together to try to be helpful and sort it out and, and be of help. And I think that, that that reaction and that method is lovely and productive. And we need to understand you know, and do more of that kind of thing because because a, a piece of being productive as individuals and as sovereigns coming together in these messy, squishy relationships is building high trust environments and helping one another overcome our weaknesses. Uh, we, we, this is as much sort of therapy as it is like, like life, life platform and life business. And uh, the, the better we can do that, I think uh, the better we will all be. Very, very quickly. I think we, we emphasize a lot what we have in commons as connectors, but we all have different methods and we need to be more aware of our complementarities because that's also what makes us work as a collective. Over. Love that, Marc-Antoine. Klaus? Yeah, I wanted to <clears throat> pick up on what Pete was saying because I think that uh, it's really uh, sort of a profound uh, way to look at, at, at the markets evolving. The, the high-tech markets when, when the uh, tech revolution happened, you had concurrently innovations taking place in the hardware development and in software development. And, and these innovations somehow found their way to merge together. Um, and, and out of it came some really big players, you know, as we, as we see today. Now imagine if you would have to turn this whole thing upside down and reinvent it. And that's where we are with the food system because here in the US, almost 90% of the markets are controlled by very few corporate players. I mean, maybe six companies, right, who dominate the entire market. Globally, the market is maybe 60% or so controlled. And I just got into a conversation uh, on, on LinkedIn with someone who um, wants to reject any kind of, of interference because, um, companies that promise to help a country like Indonesia or, or Honduras or, or no, in, in, in India with their agriculture actually ended up damaging them, damaged their entire economy, their civilization, their social structures. I mean, it is incredible when you start looking at how much, what a mess we have made, right? I mean, uh, in, and I was <laughs> participating in it, but, the, the, and, and inadvertently, so to change now in the food system, you know, you have to, it's not only that you have to build it from ground on up, but you also have to do it against the opposition of a system that really doesn't want you to succeed, right? Uh, because you're, you're challenging existing uh, 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 very uh, uh, dominant uh, structures here. And, and, and so that adds a dimension to it that requires a completely different approach. You know, the, the, the creativity and the, uh, the tools that are out there that could be assembled you know, to make a community really successful um, have an obstacle course to pass through before they can really get there. So, so, so that, that I think, um, we want to see that same kind of evolution happening in, in the food systems uh, development, and it is incredibly necessary. I just posted an article where science is basically now clear, you know, project drawdown, everybody is clear without fixing the food system. We can't uh, meet the IPCC targets. It's impossible. I mean, it's physically impossible. So how do we, how do we get there? So that's... Um, thanks, Klaus. Um, 
a couple things. One is um, uh, another analogy, uh, and I'm rewinding a little bit in this conversation. Uh, Klaus, you had said about piecing the different parts together and in talking with Christine yesterday, one of the analogies that came up for me is like you're trying to build a rose window. And what we have right now is a lot of people building individual little pieces of glass. And then someone takes this ugly sort of the substance called lead and basically solders together the different pieces of glass. And all of a sudden, you have the rose window, which sort of comes into, into being. And I'm, I'm looking for, for metaphors that work for the role I think OGM can play, is, is like not necessarily building out parts of all these things, but, but helping connect the different moving parts in ways that offer local diversity and preference, uh, lots of autonomy and privacy, and yet high functionality and connectivity and, and sort of this, this uh, uh, reusability of data, the nurturing of the soil, which is the, 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 new, the new commons, the data. Um, so all of that. And then going back to your, your, what you, how you were thinking about innovation brokers, Klaus, um, that first, when you described the first mapping step of coming into a community, uh, my first reaction was, my first reaction was, OMG, this could be really like a, a whole difficult thorny thing because actually trying to map the politics of any local situation, there are plenty of people who don't want those dynamics you know, visible or exposed who won't tell you who's who or what's what. Like getting, getting to the actual dynamics in a community is going to be like very, very difficult. Second thought was, hmm, could you crowdsource aspects of that map anyway? by surveying something, by picking up data, by looking at, at other sort of outside measures. Third reaction was, hmm, what if there were, what if we had a cadre of young community mappers who were busy doing this all over the place, uh, who then turned the soil for the next wave of people to come in to say, okay, I'm a resource mapper. Now I see the community map and here, here's what's available in the world somehow. So, so I went from, oh my gosh, this sounds impossible to, hey, could we hack it? to I could see sort of layers of, 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 commit, of commitment or participation or entry into a local communities building up. And that was just my brain riffing on, on the possibilities of how to, you know, how to stand up in, uh, innovation brokers uh, locally. Go ahead, Pete. Re reflecting on, on Silicon Valley again, the, um, it occurs to me, I put this in the chat in, in Mattermost, um, the, the people who you worked with, uh, you know, you went to your bank or you went to your um, uh, IP attorney or you went to your patent lawyer or you went to an accountant even, you know, whatever, I, um, <clears throat> HR people helping you fill jobs, um, mm -hmm. they would be seeing a ton of what we would call sovereigns. They would be seeing a ton of startups and they would start to notice patterns. And often they were the ones who did innovation brokerage basically as not as a frontline part of their job, but as as incidental, not in a small way, but incidental to their main job, right? As I'm providing you patent attorney services, hey, you should you should bump into this person, um, and they know what's going on about the other part of the the problem that you don't you know you haven't figured out yet. Um, VCs, so VCs maybe do that as a part of. It, it, it's actually part of their business model mm -hmm. to be matchmaking and marrying up people to make a stronger um, sovereign. But a, a lot of other infrastructure providers don't have that as an explicit part of their business model, right? It's it's just that as a patent attorney, I get more deal flow when somebody says, oh, uh, I got recommended to meet my co-founder mm -hmm. by this patent attorney and I want to use them again and I think you should use them again. So it reminds me of a pattern that we used to have in social text uh, where what we learned often was that people didn't like go, oh, I'm going to put stuff in the wiki. Um, it was a lot more like I'm doing work and if I just have a little bit of extra work to do to to get something into the wiki, maybe not not perfectly, I'll do it right. So, the, it's a that that same pattern of sometimes, many times, maybe 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 the right pattern kind of to hunt for is how can the things that have to happen for sovereigns also do a little bit of matchmaking uh, incidentally to the mainline part of their their work. Um, uh, so. It, it takes a lot of kind of in the overall system, it takes a lot of calories to stand up a special pur purpose. So maybe another way to say it is in Silicon Valley, I didn't see, 
I'm going to go back on that now. I was going to say I didn't see people who were explicitly just matchmakers um, because that doesn't pay the bills. You know, being a patent attorney does, being an accountant does. Um, I There were actually specialists uh, who would be mentors uh, to baby startups. Um, like Coach they, Bill Campbell? You know, I, 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 a star nursery kind of star nursery people who would, would gather up little um, startups and then they would ask for a big chunk of, of um, uh, equity kind of uh, to do that. Uh, but they could, they could be the, it was like a um, tour guide or a, a river rafting guide. You know, we'll, we'll make sure that you get through the rapids okay. Um, but even then, so they did matchmaking and stuff like that. But even then, it was kind of incidental to their overall business model, which was really getting a big percentage of one sovereign's thing rather than trying to matchmake a bunch of sovereigns together. So. Yep. Um, uh, Mark Antoine, then Judy. Um, I'll try to go fast. What strikes me, I spoke of complementary skills. I'm just a metaphor I'm reminded of when people were asking for somebody to do their website. And that meant, uh, you know, the copy editing, the graphic design, the server maintenance, uh, the uh, HTML coding, the JavaScript front end coding. It was ridiculous. Like the, the array of totally different skills that Full were design, required. Yeah, 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 it was all information there. Information architecture. And, and, and when it's obvious that this is something that a good team can work on very well and in a you know, limited time. And maybe it's, uh, A, can we either form teams around the service of connection? And so we can not try to be hired, but be, do contracts as a team. And or can we find a way that our services can augment known existing established uh, work uh, in a way that we can become part of teams, even if we maintain this cross uh, linking as a community of practice of connectors. So I think that's it. Um, that's a, a great thought, Mark Antoine. And, and that clicks really nicely into the reason I was trying hard to build guilds, a word I'm now not sure we should use. But the idea of guilds is that we're, we're in new territory here. We're kind of in the new economy. We're busy like mapping and context making and doing a whole bunch of things that are not familiar to your average sort of business person in the street. Um, therefore, how we define these tasks and how we present them to the world matters a whole bunch. And drawing sort of definitions or ba not boundaries, but, but defining what this guild is versus this other guild was to me important in outlining what the new set of tasks and roles are and then, and, and then that would help create teams of people who love collaborating to achieve those particular sets of goals. And they could form up. And one of the nice things right now is that voluntary associations to go do a project are super easy right now. And, and we all got shoved into Zoom during the pandemic. So, so geography didn't matter because it used to be you'd form a little company with your, your buddies who were, who were in, in the same city as you. Uh, right now, that's the, even post pandemic, that's just less interesting, less, less, less necessary. So uh, you can form up into these little high-performing teams, and we need, a, we need a vessel for high-performing teams. Like if I were running LinkedIn, one of the things they've left on the table, for example, is the formation of, of high-performance teams that love to do work together. They think of, you know, LinkedIn ate the resume, and now like lots of people hunt for jobs the old way uh, through LinkedIn. But, but LinkedIn is just, just like missing all these opportunities. Uh, uh, Phil, then Pete. Uh, I think it was Judy next. Oh, I'm, I apologize, Judy. That's right. I, I've, I've, I've some, suddenly grown accustomed to the little hands going up, but it's Judy, then Phil and Pete. That's okay. Um, Thanks. No Thanks, worries. Mark. I'm still kind of on the wake up cycle. I slipped in. Um, but part of what I wanted to just emphasize is that what I have found richest about OGM over the last recent years, dates clear back to Yitan, but especially now, um, is the caliber of the individuals and the collective expertise in any particular room call, whatever. Um, just highly talented mm -hmm. ethical people who are more than happy to help with just about anything. 
Um, they don't want to be taken advantage of, of course, and everyone would like to earn some money if that's a possibility. And so it seems to me that one of our higher priority goals might be to really focus on the resource capacity that's latent everywhere. And implicitly by setting up systems and connections and um, tools or whatever might be the case, setting an example, kind of the leading and walking by example model of good people helping other people do good things. And I, I get, again, I don't especially like the, the term guilds because it has a funny tone to it, but, but I don't know, talent agents, talent contributors, um, express special knowledge groups, whatever we would come up with as a more awkward name. <laughs> Um, what I find really, really attractive is the wisdom that's expressed in every call and the ability on the drop of a hat to put out a query and say, does anybody have time to talk about X? And four to six people who are interested in and knowledgeable about that topic will usually show up. And that's a very unique trait. And I, I think that somehow capturing and, and taking the wisdom of all of the people in the things that have worked might allow us to actually include in the wiki or something similar, you know, how to get started on blank. <laughs> and, and what are the next stages, you know, sort of a, 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 a simplified project management for individuals who haven't had project management training or other things. Because I think if people get help without having to work hard to get it, they affiliate and they become inspired by that same model. And I, I think the number of abusers of that was probably small. And if they wanted, they could find some other knowledge in a different way. So I don't know, that's just kind of, I'm kind of into what is the process of being collectively wise and productive and how might we model that, share that and help other groups with less experience, acquire those skills. Thanks, Judy. And, and just one of the um, one of the tasks of, of our community is to deal with bad actors. One of the principles of design from trust is to try to deal with bad actors late rather than design the whole system to prevent bad actors from acting bad. Because when you design the whole system that way, you shut out the genius that's in the room, you shut down opportunity and connection and all of that. Uh, and one of the things we haven't faced very much is sort of trolls or bad actors floating in here and either uh, just trying to disrupt or uh, trying to pilfer, you know, take intellectual property, do whatever else and, and take advantage of the group. We've been really lucky in that sense. Uh, but we're still flying under the radar in, in that way. Um, but I think that uh, pieces of our maturity will show up and, our, and we'll have to find new ways to do things when that starts happening more. But, but again, I, I think that doing it late is fine, is good. And setting up, setting up dynamics that promote the building of the commons and the, the connecting of humans into high-performing teams and all the, the questing into solutions, uh, like, I think should work. So, uh, Phil, then Pete. Um, yeah, Judy, I, I love that point. Um, I... In thinking through this kind of Silicon Valley example, I keep coming back to Y Combinator startup school and they have kind of this whole free process laid out so that you can get your idea from ideation on through to MVP basically. And the idea is that if it's good enough, you can apply to Y Combinator as one of their select startups that they'll incubate, that they'll foster, they'll grow. Obviously they're doing that model that leads to profit for them but I think there are learnings from that that we can take and kind of bring into our own environment to bring a communal and shared learnings. Um, a second uh, group I, I think of is Zebras Unite, which is their core goal is, is trying to, to create this new economy, but they have this whole network of people that you can put out calls to action. You can ask for, for help, for resources. And if people are interested, they can help. And I feel like that's a model you might want to copy a bit as well, or at least taken to, to some account. The one thing I would say with them is they do have this focus of creating this new econ economy. I do think we need some core focuses, like the knowledge weaving project, like interoperability, like we need to have, OGM is a community for all this. 
OGM is working on these things um, as kind of separate um, definitions. But yeah, that's mm -hmm. super. Thanks, Phil. Uh, Pete? Um, I wanted to pick up on the grouping formerly known as guilds. Um, and it, it makes me think of a, a thing that we used to, um, a guideline that we used to use in Agile, which is the highest performing teams were self-sufficient work groups, uh, project groups. Um, so self-sufficient means that it can do a lot of stuff by itself. Um, uh, you know, it's got front end, back end uh, design, um, uh, some project management, things like that. Um, so a project team uh, had a, uh, it was, it had a variety of, of kind of specializations within it and it could do a lot of work. The thing that makes it a high performing team is that it's not people who are all good at one thing. It's that it's people who love to work with these people. Um, so that activation energy, you know, um, I, you know, I do design and she does, um, uh, she does product management and, and he does uh, development. Um, and we love to work together. The love to work together is the, the important part of that. Not that we, you know, and, the, and, and actually we don't even necessarily need to understand each other really well, as long as we have the patience and the interest in discovering how to work together as a team, right? Um, the other, the other thing that we, that we kind of, I, another guideline in, uh, talking about Scrum here in particular, um, there's this weird thing in companies where it's like, well, you know, I've, I've divined the, the org chart and this group of people shall work together because, you know, that's what fits best in my org chart. Um, uh, and then you end up with, you putting, you, you end up putting people together who work, some work well together and there's one or two duds who just don't work with that team. And they may work perfectly well with another team, but for whatever reason, because of departments or offices or whatever, you stick them in the wrong team. Uh, that's a real tempting thing for management to do. And it was always super disastrous for the team itself. Um, you really want, uh, Scrum goes on like two week cycles, right? Two week sprints. You really want the team to come together at the end of the sprint and, and reflect. Uh, um, retros are also something that didn't end up People, people didn't really understand how to do retros, but if you do it right, you have this deep introspective, team introspective of what worked, what didn't. And, you know, after the third time of coming around to, and Anne, she's a love, I like, you know, I like being around her as a person. And every time that she's in our team, it just breaks everything. And I don't know why, you know, you know, and when you come to that, you know, this person doesn't fit in our team, you throw them out. Um, uh, hopefully in some compassionate and loving way where they end up with some, some other team that where they're going to shine, everything is better, right? The team is more productive. You can't, you, you don't want to stick a team together that doesn't fit together. You really want the team to be able to self-select and weed out the, the things that are making them not work. And sometimes that's uh, a, a person. So, um, so it, so then you end up with these project teams who work really well together and that's their defining characteristic, not that they're front end or not that they're back end, but they work really well together. Then you need um, parallel teams adjacent to them. Um, and you'll start to see that each of these teams has a back end person or each of these teams has a design person. So you do want to end up with something that kind of is like the organization formerly known as Guild. Uh, where, you know, all the design people can have coffee together and say, okay, well, I ran into this weird problem or I need a tool. What, what's that tool that you were using that you were using so effectively? So into this, I wanted to introduce or reintroduce uh, a, a classic. Um, I'm going to hit return on um, the matter most and then try to share my screen as well. Uh, this I'm is a glad. picture uh, this is uh, Nyberg's picture of scaling at Spotify. And one of the things that uh, whenever I bring this to a group, it's like, okay, so Nyberg himself, if you read down a little bit, says that this is just a, a snapshot in time. This is not the way to design an organization. Please don't be fooled by the fact that this looks attractive and wonderful. 
do it your own way, you'll see that what he, what I was calling a project team is what he calls squads. Um, and then you'll see that guild thing. Uh, these are a bunch of people who are interested, community of interest, interested in databases or um, CSS or, you know, the design of stuff or information architecture or whatever. Um, he's got another thing he calls chapters. Chapters for him are things where these people need to coordinate pretty closely together. Um, uh, they're doing kind of the same rule in multiple squads and to help hold the squads together, the chapter of, of design people or the chapter of database people will, will coordinate and, and cross, uh, keep, keep these squads kind of aligned. And then as it happens, he's got the, the tribe parts of this are big clusters of things. Maybe uh, this left tribe is working on the back end and the right tribe is working on the, on the front end, um, big clusters of stuff. Anyway, it, so it occurs to me that along with the organizations formerly known as guilds, um, I think a more important, even more important pattern for us to look for is people who work really well together. Uh, these squads um, and uh, and help people understand that you put together a high performing team. It's got a lot of cross functional stuff. It's not all of them can do the same thing. It's it's actually the the strength of that um, team is that they can do different things. And so when you say, uh, hey, we need this new feature in Spotify, um, you know, one of these squads can go. We can do that. You know, we're going to have to ask this other squad for a little bit of help, but we can do most of it. We can do the front end part. We can do the design part. We can do the back end part. We can do the database part. Um, and our database person is going to coordinate with two or three other database people as they do it. But we can handle the whole thing as a team. And then they take chunks of big chunks of work as a project and they get them done. Um, that activates also a bunch of human stuff when, when you're in a small a team like this um, and you have a group commitment you say yes we can do this yes we will do this and we can do it for x dollars in x months um, then those are the people that when push comes to shove they look across the table or across the zoom at each other and go okay we need to pick it up people and it's the commitment to the team that activates their energy and not commitment to something larger that's puffier and harder to understand it's like I'm going to do it because Emily is doing it because we committed as a small team that we're a team that delivers stuff and we're going to do it. So I, we haven't, I feel like we haven't been talking about this uh, project team thing uh, very much. And, and that's not to say that we should talk about only that uh, there's these other, you know, other patterns that you, and not again, not to say that this is the exact pattern that you want to use, but the things that I learned from this or the thing that I observed from this is he's got these overlapping kind of fractal patterns and they're, they're, um, uh, they're orthogonal, right? So a squad and a chapter are, have this orthogonality to it. And I think that's important when we're trying to structure these, you know, social, social groupings that we cover a lot of axes and also a lot of fractal scale. Um, briefly, because I have to bounce at the top of the hour to a different call and I'm happy to pass the con to, to someone else. Um, Pete, when they talk about guilds, I had the feeling on first read of this that they meant something different from what I was hoping to intend, which was for me, guilds are about craft, a particular set of skills, uh, kind of like furriers and carpenters. Uh, and I think Guild is a different subset in their model. Otherwise, I really like the Spotify Agile model. I, I again, I would not, I you know, rename everything, group it differently, figure yeah. out different orthogonals. Don't okay. take it as a literal. But uh, his guilds are communities of interest. Um, okay, which so they were, they were just around interests. Yeah, they were just around interests. Okay, cool. Uh, Michael, then Judy, then we're out of the call. Um. I'm I'm really intrigued by by what uh, what comes out of that chart. And when I first saw it, Pete, I thought um, of different organizations um, being the two um, you know parts of Spotify and the way that peers in an industry. I mean, I just remember you know from my days in the magazine biz how the 
the clan of editors and art directors and production managers cooperated for their common good and you know recommended freelancers and and that kind of thing and and also set standards um, and so figuring out how that looks for um, for or, or where our OGM fits into that in terms of um, allowing allowing people in different orgs to to come together um, it seems seems critical and and part of the kind of mission statement that we need to to get down to because it's more brass tacks. Um, one of the industries that sort of figured a lot of this out is Hollywood uh, and other movie makers where everybody knows what a gaffer does, even though muggles don't know what a gaffer is. But I think down to how you coil cable so that people are basically interchangeable and then your reputation and who you know basically is how much work you get. Sorry, Judy, go ahead. Well, I was just going to add that, that what this leads to actually would be the listings or collections of wisdom about particular needed skills and attributes and behaviors that allow the cross-functional connections to occur. Because team formation is an organic sort of thing. I recall once a team approaching me on the steps of a building saying, can we eject a person from our team? And I said, well, probably, but tell me more about what's going on. And those dynamics are really um, critical to sort of the heart and chemistry of the working together and if we were able to develop um, some sort of correlation listing of individuals who behaved in certain ways, delivered certain kinds of things, had knowledge in certain zones, whatever, without making it proscriptive or prohibitive or elitist or whatever, I think then it would be a tool for the community. And people would know that they could call person X and saying, I'm trying to put together a group of people to do X in the community or to accomplish Y, and we need someone who would be able to help with this dimension of it, or we need help just forming it because the group's not coming together like we'd like. Those sorts of expertise zones are really valuable. And that could be a very cornerstone, the, the connectivity of the talents of the guild is what I'm trying to get at. The ability to resource to form the cohesive team. And if the team forms and they find that they're really great at kicking out these kinds of things, you can just get the whole team to come do something because you know that team's going to get it done. They know how exactly. to work together and so on. Exactly. So it, I'm not sure how we would do that, but it's, it's a concept I'd love to pursue because that's how you get work done. Uh, a bad note to end this call on, but we could just bring someone in who knows machine learning really well, and since we're all on Zoom, to just infer people's competence and behavior from our activities, and then to shut down their privileges as they act poorly, you know, so you'd get less Zoom time allocated to you. <laughs> anyway, uh, thanks, everybody. I'm glad we're inventing our robot future, and uh, hope it's a future we all like. Bye for now. Great to see everyone. Same here.